and made honey because it tastes so good. Uh, but I quickly learned that honeybees are not the only species of bee. In fact, they're the only species that make honey, but there's other species as well. Does anyone guess how many species of bees there are globally? Just shout it out. 700, 1,600, any other guesses? So there's actually 20,000 different species of bees. Um, in North America, there's about 4,000 species, and in California, it's about 1,600 species of bees. So each picture here is a different species of bee, and you can see that they really have a variety of colors and shapes, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of that diversity. So before we do that, what is a bee? What makes it a bee and not just any other insect? Well, insects belong to a group called the Hymenoptera, um, and that includes the bees, the wasps, and the ants. But what makes a bee a bee and not a wasp or an ant is that it has special branching hairs all over its body. So you can kind of see on these pictures that each hair on the bee is almost like a, a tree trunk or a branch. And that's what makes a bee such an amazing pollinator. So bees collect pollen and nectar. They get pollen for protein and nectar for carbohydrates. And as they collect, pollen gets stuck to their bodies and they move from flower to flower. Um, and that's how they pollinate. That's how they move pollen around. So wasps, for example, could have hair, but they wouldn't have these branching hairs. So bees can range in size. So I have two different bees here that you can see relative to a honeybee. So on the left is a stingless bee, this tiny little black bee that's, you know, almost the size of a honeybee leg. And then on the right is a very special bee. This is Wallace's giant bee. I thought this bee was extinct up until like five years ago. Um, there was an expedition, uh, the American Natural History Museum went to Indonesia to find this bee, and they did find it. And they found it somewhere really, really strange. This bee actually lives in the active nests of termites. And it has these really, really big mandibles. It's not for fighting termites, it's for collecting resin to line its nest with. So it like tunnels into a termite nest and makes a, a resin lined cavity and lays it there. No one knows why, but very strange. You can see that relative to a honeybee, it's really large. And so there's this great diversity. Bees range in habits. So we think about honeybees, they're in hives that we provide them, but other bees have to live in our environment. So bees might live in the ground, they might make their own nests, or they might use pre-existing cavities, or they might live above ground. So maybe in a stem or a reed, they might dig it out themselves, like maybe you've seen carpenter bees digging into your home, or they might use something that already exists. Bees also vary in how they look. And um, one of their morphological features is their pollen carrying apparatus. So some bees have what we call a scopa, which is a dense brush of hairs, and that's how they pack and move pollen around. So that bee in the top, it has its scopa, it has a dense brush of hairs on its hind legs on the upper part. And then this bee on the bottom here, it actually has its pollen carrying apparatus on its abdomen. So it'll land on onto its abdomen. That's where all the special branching hairs are. Other bees, instead of having a dense brush of hairs, have a scooped up basket. Can I ask a question? Um, I, I was kind of giving an analogy that the hair is kind of like Velcro. The pollen gets stuck to it as they move around. Um, so some bees have a scooped out basket, and we call that a corbicula. So honeybees and bumblebees and carpenter bees um, have this feature. So this is a, a honeybee thumb, and you can see you know, the hind legs with the pollen. And then this bee is doing something really interesting. It actually has no pollen on its body. Uh, does anyone guess where, where is its pollen carrying structure? What's going on here? What, what did you guess? Mandibles? So not a bad guess. Antenna. Antenna. So some bees actually collect pollen and nectar in their crop, their upper digestive part, but not this bee. This bee actually doesn't have a pollen carrying structure because it steals pollen from other bees. It's what we call a parasitic bee. So it will go into the nest of another bee species and lay its egg. That egg will hatch into a larva which will eat the pollen and nectar 
uh, of its host bee. I might even eat the larva of the host, so it could even be carnivorous. So we call these kleptoparasitic bees, um, or cuckoo bees. If you know anything about birds, we use that same terminology um, for kleptoparasitic birds, cuckoo birds. This is my favorite bee, Osmia avocetta. And it's really special because it makes its nest out of flower petals. It's found only in Turkey. Um, so this right here is an egg, and it's inside one of these little tiny nests that it makes out of flowers. So really, really beautiful. Um, and so hopefully you start to appreciate how these are so different from one of these, right? In California, I think I mentioned, we have 1,600 species of bees. Um, and we really have a lot of diversity here as well. So we have anything from the male valley carpenter bee, which is like a fluffy teddy bear, to yellow face bee, which is really, really small and sleek, and has unique yellow markings on its body. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how we categorize bees. Josh, can you give me time check right now? We're running. Yeah, uh, 219. Okay, cool. Okay. So, when we talk about bees, we classify them into genus and species. You remember, remember this mnemonic, King Philip cried, oh for goodness sake. So, bees are part of the kingdom Animalia, they're animals. They're arthropods, which includes insects, and scorpions, and spiders, and all the creepy crawlies. They're in a class called Insecta. Insecta are arthropods that have three body parts and three pairs of legs. And then they're in the Hymenoptera with the wasps and the ants. And then there's seven families of bees, seven categories. So we'll talk about that really briefly. So the first family of bees are the Coletids, or Coletidae. And these are called the plaster or polyester bees. I think there's about 6,000 species in this family. And they're called the polyester bees because they line their cells with secretions that when they dry, become kind of transparent like cellophane. Then we have the megachilids. And these are called leaf cutter bees because they use leaves to line their nests. Um, maybe you've seen some of their markings in your own garden in here in California. Um, they'll kind of leave these holes in the leaves. Uh, it doesn't harm the plant, but you know, it's a little bit of aesthetic damage. And they use that, they, they carry it into their mandibles over to their nest, and they make partitions with it. And their scopa is always on their abdomen. Apidae, so this includes our honeybees, and bumblebees, carpenter bees, uh, lots of other bees. It's a really large family, and it has a lot of diversity within it, lots of different colors and shapes. And a lot of these bees have corbicula instead of scopa. We have adrenaline bees, and I threw up a kind of really difficult to see feature of this bee just to show you kind of what bee uh, taxonomists look for when they're identifying bees. Uh, this, you know, family of bees has these two special sutures under their antennal base. It's usually covered in hair, uh, but if you were to look at it under a microscope, you would see it. And I love this picture just because it shows um, how the pollen is blue and it's carrying blue pollen. Just really neat uh, to, to think about that. All the different colors of then we have slut bees. These can be brown, they can be stripy, they can be black, or they can be green. Um, here in this region, we have a genus called Agapesmon, which is this bright, bright green bee. Sometimes people think it's a fly, um, but it actually is a bee. It's called a sweat bee because it's attracted to the minerals and salts in our sweat. And so you might even bat it away thinking, oh, what's that annoying fly? It's actually a little bee. And then the last two families you're not likely to see here because they're only found in Africa and Australia, but I just wanted to throw their names up there. I um, mean, you know, I know some people love identification stuff. So why are bees so important? We mentioned that they pollinate crops. There's about 130 different agricultural crops that rely on bees for pollination. So without bees, our grocery store would look very, very different. Maybe you've heard that our bee populations are declining. What are some of the reasons that you guys have heard for bee declines, or why do you think bees are, are dying? First thing I want to say is pesticides. Okay, pesticides is one. What, what else? Varroa mites. Varroa mites, yeah, that's parasite. That's a good one. So varroa mites are only on honeybees, um, but there's other parasites and pathogens that impact the other species. Losing flowers. Losing flowers. You guys had all of them. 
So there's pesticides. Pesticides refer to insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides. And they don't necessarily directly kill bees, but they can have non-target impacts. Um, you know, sublethal doses can do things like cause diarrhea or disorientation to a bee. Lack of flowers. So there's a lot of agricultural intensification. Um, there's urbanization. So we're losing earth and we're losing natural habitat and flowers and plants that bees need to survive. And then parasites and pathogens. Someone you know brought up one. There's actually 21 different RNA viruses that bees can get sick with. Um, there's a lot of parasites like microsporidians that get them as well. And all of these things interact together. So you know you can imagine if you were sick with a cold, maybe you would get over it. But if you weren't eating enough or, or you know diverse diet, you're getting exposed to some toxins. That cold might turn into pneumonia. So it's sick for a bee. All of these things alone been shown not to kill bees, um, but together is what, is what really is harming their populations. And then there's how we manage agriculture. Sorry, question. Yeah. Um, does, uh, have on their no. no. I'll just keep going because there's no point in talking about it. No. Um, those, those, the, no. Okay. Um, industrial agriculture. So this is a picture of the Central Valley. This is almond bloom. And uh, late February, you know, March. And you can see how this entire landscape is filled with flowers. And at first thought, you know, like, oh, that's really, really good for bees. But this bloom only lasts for two weeks out of the year, which means that bees can't live in this environment naturally. They need bloom for longer than two weeks out of the year. Um, and so as a result of this kind of landscape intensification and management, we have to bring in bees to pollinate this landscape. So every year, from all over the U.S., and from Canada, Two and a half million hives are actually trucked over to the Central Valley of California to call them almonds um, because bees can't naturally live in that environment. In fact, uh, myself and a group of researchers went out to the Central Valley. We went to go survey bees in almonds and we're out there for about a month and, and we got two different species. I'm not even kidding. It said honeybees and like 11 wild bee individuals. It was nuts. There's nothing. They're, they're not there. Um, it's just a very desolate environment. Central Valley is in like 90, I can't remember if it's 90 or like 95 percent habitat loss since the 1890s. So bees are trucked all over the country. Um, this is kind of hard to read because it's a kind of dark. But basically, in the spring, we're out in the Central Valley pollinating almonds. You know, they might get some apples and cherries in California. Um, then in the summer, they head to North and South Dakota where they have clover and sunflower. In the spring and summer, some of them go to Michigan and Wisconsin for blueberry and cranberries, and some others go to melons and cucumbers in Texas. And then in the winter, a lot of them go to Florida because it's warm year round. So really, they're mostly pollinating the invasive peppermints here. And you know, they go all around. These are different bees than the bees that are used for honey production. These are just migratory bees just for pollination. So this is stressful on bees, um, but luckily in response there's been a lot of interest in how to conserve bees and what we can do. How much time do I have? Josh, talk about bee conservation. 225. 225, okay. Great. So in your own backyard, oh no, it got cut off a little bit, but I put this link um, on the very last slide, and so I have two more times in the presentation. Um, in your own backyard, you can plant flowers for bees. Um, there's a lot of pollinator demonstration gardens that you can visit. There's citizen science programs. And then growers are, are, are working towards bee conservation as well. There's now certifications that are voluntary that growers can participate in, um, like the Xerxes Society has a Bee Better program. And growers are adding in plants for bees. Um, in these two pictures, there are hedgerows, which are strips of drought-tolerant perennials um, that provide year-round resources for so bee-friendly initiatives have some things in common. Um, you know, they usually involve adding flowers and then changing agricultural practices in some ways. Oh no, my graph didn't make didn't make it um, with the transition on the USB. But I was just going to show some data from my lab um, that showed in urban environments and cities where there are more flowers, there's a higher number of pollinators, and the line goes like this. Sorry, it's a technological snafu, so I guess this, this graph didn't make it. Um, so we 
know that adding flowers are good for bees, but there's some specifics to know as well. So you need a lot of flowers in your garden. You need many different kinds. And then you need to consider when they bloom. So a lot of people all, you know, put out pollinator flowers and they have a beautiful summer bloom, but they maybe don't have flowers that bloom in the spring or in the fall. But there are bees that live year round. Um, bumblebees, for example, come out in the spring. Some mason bees come out really, really early in the spring. And then there's some species that are like in the fall. The other thing you can think about is spatial clustering. So if you plant, let's say, one lavender here, and another one in the back, you know, of your garden, and then another one in the middle. You know, three plants is great, but they'll have a lot of bigger impact on bees if you put them all together. Um, bees make a lot of decisions about efficiency when they forage, and it exhausts them to move from flower to flower. They prefer to go to one type of flower in a region and work it, and then go to another cluster and then work it. Um, so you want to do large clusters of your plant species. Um, we at UC Extension have put together a bunch of bee garden recipes, and so you can actually go to this website, I put it on the very last slide of the presentation as well, and look at different pictures of plants and say, I really love this garden, and it'll give you a combination of plants that are spring plants, summer plants, and fall plants. And there's like, you know, 12 of these different recipes that you can follow. The website is in our catalog, the ucnr.edu slash pdf 8518. I put it on the very last slide of the presentation, so at the very end it'll be up to longer. Yeah. So how do we know this? How do we know which flowers are good, which flowers are bad? Um, I just wanted to quickly talk about some of my research. What's my time? Maybe I'll just stop. You're okay. Yeah, I'll just stop. It's, uh, it's 229. So. 2.29. I'm going to finish. First of all, I'm just going to skip to one last note. Okay, this one came out at least. Go, go ahead and finish your talk. Okay, I'll just, I'll just, I'll end here because this is really no, interesting. No, 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 go ahead and, and finish up. You know, okay, I will. To your presentation. Um, so, I wanted to discuss how we know this information and share that. You know, as researchers, we go out into the environment and we catalog the different species that we see. We look at the vegetation, we look at features of gardens and farms. But one of the interesting things that's come up year after year is the impact of mulch. Um, mulch has a lot of positive impacts in your garden. It can suppress weeds, it can retain soil moisture, but gardens that have more mulch consistently have fewer pollinators and fewer pollinator species. So that's kind of a weird finding, but when you think about the ecology, it kind of makes sense. Bees nest in the ground and they cannot dig through mulch. They need access to undisturbed air soil. So one of the things we recommend is yes, use mulch, but consider leaving a part of your garden undisturbed. Maybe around your fences or along the back. Leave some bare ground um, that bees have access to. Um, so the top bee collects mud to line the above ground cavity, and then the smaller bee is actually digging into the dirt um, in order to make its nest. But use an undisturbed, quiet area in the garden to do that. And that's it. And I thought I would leave that link up, but I guess it wasn't on my slide. So let me just go back so they could have it. Yeah. So is it helpful to make little mason bees uh, uh, Yeah. Wood, you know? Yeah. So someone asked about bee hotels. So you may have seen that you can purchase or make your own hotels of reeds, or you can drill holes into wood logs and put them in your garden. It is and it isn't helpful. Um, it's helpful because it creates an environment for pollinators, but it artificially aggregates them into one spot, and they're more likely to share parasites and pathogens at those nests, especially because people don't clean them. It's the same thing for birds. So like, it's nice to put out, you know, sugar water in your bird feeder, but actually it's a primary source of parasite transmission for birds if you don't clean out your, 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 your you know, your bird feeder every year. Same with those hotels, and they're really hard to clean because they're porous. Um, but if you do use them, take them down once a year, or when there's no bees in it, kind of wipe them down with like a bleach solution or vinegar solution. Uh, it seems like you could manage orchard mason bees to pollinate the uh, almonds. And, and, and any comments or observations along that line? There are people who are doing that. There are a lot of challenges. So blue orchard bees um, are in the process of being domesticated. There's some people who manage them domestic, like domestically, and then um, sell them to growers annually to pollinate almonds. They are not quite early enough. 
Oh wait, yeah, they're not quite early enough, and so you kind of have to like artificially um, induce their emergence. So you start start them out during refrigeration, yeah. and then pull them out. Yeah, you, you know, know some right skilled time. beekeepers are able to put them out and maintain their population and pull them out again. But yeah, but most people like they just come out and they die, um, and they have to like just buy them fresh every year. Um, yeah, and they're subject to the same parasite pathogen issues that honeybees are. There, it's you know. Like honeybees, they're treated more like livestock, so it's like almost like separate. Yeah. yeah. And and then uh, Paul Stamets has, has found that um, there's certain uh, mushroom mm -hmm. extracts that uh, can um, um, uh, mitigate some of the, the diseases that, that bees get. So so you know, looking at the uh, negative associations with with mulch, that uh, there could be a positive. Uh, aspect of that, if the mulch is growing uh, fungus, the, the, the bees are clumping in. That makes sense to me, and I, I do know that research it was like mushrooms extracting the bees, and it did show reduced, um, it showed reduced loads of deformling virus, and they have a very uh, significant results, but it's unsure how that yeah, translates into nature, but certainly soil that's alive with fungal strains is probably better for bees to nest in. Makes sense. And then, um, uh, as far as building habitat, um, I have this concept of, of taking a, a pickup truck uh, load of uh, soil or fine um, fine sand or soil, and then just dumping it down and you know leaving that as habitat for the uh, uh, ground nesting bees. Any any thoughts um, like that? Like, yeah. It have to be the appropriate soil because yeah. I can see if you know if it's just like garden soil or growing soil, it wouldn't work. It needs yeah. to be like kind of compact. Almost like what you would naturally find. So heavy clay. Yeah, yeah, so they can dig in and not, not collapse. Yeah. Any other questions as I wrap up here? I'm going to go outside. You can just come find me and, and talk to me if you have any questions. Thank you guys. Thank you.